My name is H. Raven Rose. I'm a screenwriter and author, and I'm here because I am doing a PhD in creative writing research in Swansea, Wales, at Swansea University. And first off, I'd like to thank the Bar Society for having me. And what I'm going to talk about, for, I am primarily here, like all of you, to learn. My PhD thesis project is a script section. So I'm here to learn, but at the same time I have some sort of insider information about the intersection of depth psychology and humanity and the purpose of fiction to change people's minds. So um, most of you are probably familiar with Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It, you know, do you mind giving a show of hands to say if you are or aren't? So everybody, good, 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 good. So he says that we're innately curious, that humans are curious. But apparently there are a couple... Yes, I can. <laughs> I know, I'm soft-spoken. I'm from Appalachia, so um, I have a soft voice. So Maslow says that... Um, we're innately curious, and that is certainly a good enough reason for, on my part to go to Mars. But also, I believe that you know, colonization of Mars, as well as other planets, serves other needs, and those include basic core physiological needs, whether it's for humanity now, humanity in a thousand years, or humanity when and if the sun may explode. Um, that's a basic physiological need to have, you know, I, um, Kaku says that um, we should have a backup plan. But I also believe there's another reason to go to Mars, and that is self-actualization, which is at the very top of that hierarchy of needs pyramid. Mars is close. It's possibly um, incredibly dangerous, highly expensive, maybe formidable, and a hard-to-sell venture. I'm sure each of you has actually met people who do not understand your obsession, interest, love of colonizing the red planet. I meet people all the time who are just astounded. And then they, they talk about the problems that we're facing here on Earth and that we shouldn't spend resources in this way. And I, I actually disagree completely. I think that um, I agree with uh, my big hero of blessed memory, Ray Bradbury. I think we should be on the moon right now and heading off to Mars ASAP. So how can we change other people's minds? You know, and people don't want to you know, when people usually have a fixed opinion, they actually aren't really interested in having an open mind. People have ideas, and they like them. And the only thing that people dislike more than good advice is bad advice. <laughs> so, so there's got to be another way. And it just so happens that um, one of my main passions, as you might imagine, is story. So story, it has the power to mesmerize. It has since ancient times, and it can really spark imaginations and set people's minds on fire. And that's really what it's going to take to get humanity beyond the moon and stars and to a new planet Earth, on uh, a new Earth, really, on Mars. So Carl Sagan said, as you might know, must know if you're here, Pulitzer Prize-winning author of Cosmos, um, he said that Mars has become a kind of mythic arena onto which we project our earthly hopes and fears. We have been looking at Mars for a very long time. Um, this is mostly something to just sort of, in case something I'm saying isn't interesting, you can just look at this. <laughs> no, no. So, um, so Sci-fi, you know, we, we've long been mesmerized by the red planet. Sci-fi, currently about Mars, runs the gamut from the laughable to the actually horrifying, and, you know, and as well as idealized. So that's everything from xenophobic Martian invader fears, soul survivor fantasies, which I actually like, like Robinson Crusoe on Mars. I love that. But, but also idealistic notions of highly advanced technologically and maybe spiritually and otherwise enlightened or superior Martians in E.T. utopian paradise. And then, of course, there's also the grand vision of Mars as human colony. But if we're going to colonize Mars, how will the human race get there from here? And I have a quote from the movie The Space Between Us by the character Tom Chen, and what he said is, from a childhood vision to a space age reality from a childhood vision to a space-age reality. And so those words are a cinematic summing up 
of exactly what a revision modern Mars mythology would do for the planet. So I'm going to give, share with you some anecdotes, some historical evidence that sci-fi transmits visions and power to transform and better human lives and actually change reality. So I'm going to tell you about three people whose lives were dramatically changed and then they transformed um, all of our lives, actually. Um, so the first, um, the first one thing is I want you to imagine a small, freckle-faced, red-headed little boy. His mother passes away when he's three, and he's living um, in a circumstance where he's, you know, kind of in his imagination a lot. At 10 or 11, he reads 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. And from that moment onward, he dreams of making voyages under the water. And really, that's, that's so early, a 10-year-old boy. His name was Simon Lake. When he was 15 years old, he drew his first plans for an underwater submarine with a diving compartment. And then he grew up to design, build, and successfully test increasingly sophisticated submarines. Welcome. Thanks for coming. After his second prototype in the late 1800s made it to New York, he got a congratulatory cable from Jules Verne himself. And so he fulfilled his childhood vision of becoming, and this is, this is from his memoir, and he was a very humble man, a subaqueous pioneer, much like the characters in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And what he said was that Jules Verne was, in a sense, the director general of my life. So um, let's move on to the second anecdote. Um, this one is also really fun. And well, you'll see. I will see if it's wildly inspiring for you. It is for myself. So an eight-year-old child, his name is Earl Backen, and he's watching the 1931 version of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or Modern Prometheus, the film ad adaptation. And he hears the words, it's alive, it's alive. And of course, on screen, he sees the monster jolted <laughs> to life. <laughs> this mishmash of body parts becomes a functional being with this electricity. And, he, and so this is, um, he also has a memoir, and I really recommend it. Um, he just says that, and I'm going to read him because I want to get it exactly right. He just says, my favorites were those incredible science fiction films in which electricity, usually applied by a mad scientist, rendered someone supernaturally strong, invisible, or in some other astonishing way changed. Foremost was Frankenstein, the unforgettable story of the learned doctor who, through the magical power of electricity, gives life to a collection of inanimate body parts. And he just said it wasn't the monster for him. It really wasn't the terrifying. I, I find the monster kind of beautiful, but, but that's me. I'm a sci-fi writer. So, but he said it was really um, the doctor restoring life to the unliving. So what happened then was he grew up and he co-founded Medtronic Inc., um, which works with electrical medical devices. And after the death of um, a small infant during a, I think it was Chicago, a blackout when the power was lost, at that time, pacemakers and similar electrical devices for the heart were plugged into the wall. They were very large. One had failed, and a little tiny baby had died, and the doctor, at, who knew him really, really well, said, hey, can you do something different about, you know, for this? So he designed and made the first external battery-powered transistorized pacemaker in 1957. So an eight-year-old boy with a passion for everything electric and determined to help humanity to create a new reality for those with cardiac electrical issues and other issues, all because of a science fiction film. And my, my third story like that, and I did look for some around women, and I really only found like, um, I found one, um, actually, she's a surgeon, but she actually didn't have time to share anything or else just didn't actually have inspiration. I've only seen like one uh, woman, and this may be the era we're talking about 100 years ago um, when these novels were written, but um, for, so they're all men. <laughs> so um, the third name, I think everyone in this room will recognize, and it is Sikorsky, synonymous with helicopters, technological advances, and the prowess of the armed forces. Igor Ivanovich Sikorsky read Jules Verne's 1886 novel, Rober the Conqueror, which is also known as the Clipper of the Clouds, at age 10 or 11 or so, and it inspired him to build a helicopter. And then 
he founded Sikorsky Aircraft in 1923 and built both fixed wing aircraft and later helicopters. Um, I want to just point something out about all, all three of these men, and it's identical to the way things work in a hero's journey or in most stories, especially feature films, is all of them went through multiple try-fail cycles. And, and this is what we would need to do to get to colonize Mars. Um, so it, when you're writing a script, you usually only have time for three try-fail cycles. So that, that means for it, to be, for it to really be successful, and this is, this is almost mathematical, um, you can't just give someone what they want with very little effort. It just isn't real to us as humans because we know better. And the thing that's so remarkable about all of these men is how relentless they were in pursuit of their goals. Even Sikorsky, for example, it took him a long, long time to get the helicopter working. He, at first, he had to just settle for fixed-wing aircraft. <laughs> he wouldn't want to settle for that. But he... Um, he would not give up his dream or his passion, you know. And, and that's what we have to do when we talk about finding our way to the red planet. It doesn't matter how long it takes. And, and that kind of leads me to a really great quote. Sikorsky's son said that his father said two things were imprinted on his mind and inspired his dream of inventing a helicopter. And the first was the helicopter-like vehicle in the clipper of the clouds. He just couldn't stop thinking about that vehicle. And the second thing was a Jules... Vern quote. Now, he, he doesn't have it exact, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you the way he remembered it, and then I'm going to tell you the way it was. And it doesn't really matter if we get quotes right, because you're going to hear the exact inspiration that led this little boy, 10 or 11, to grow up to become this person who gave this tremendous gift to humanity. So the quote as he remembered it, and as he kept talking about to all of his children all of his life and anyone else who would listen, anything that one man can imagine another man can make real. So very, very, very powerful. Because if, if somebody believes that, then you don't care how many tri-fail cycles you go through. You just refine your approach, refine your approach, get better technology, you know, um, the, you know well, where there's a will, there's a way. But so the, the actual quote is um, from Jules Verne's book, The Steam House, and it's all that is within the limits of possibility may and shall be accomplished which is also a really great quote. It, it means that um, if you have a good reason to believe that something is logical, then, and it's within the limits of possibility, then it's doable. So science fiction is possibility thinking plus directed imagination and inventiveness. And that process is also alchemical in, in a neurologic sense in that it changes minds. So. Think about this again, several preteen boys, all of them, who assume the power to rewrite reality because of a science fiction story, whether film or book. So how do stories have this strange power to spark imagination and then lead to this directed action or invention? Has anybody here seen the 1990 film Total Recall, the original? Thank God. <laughs> A lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it's campy, and I know it's risque in moments, but, but it's, that's, a, that's an amusing film. So the thing is, you will, you will probably all remember that, that uh, Douglas Quaid started having these dreams about Mars, and he couldn't forget them, and he soon began to not be able to totally distinguish between fantasy and reality. What was real, and who was he, and where had he been? And he actually went to go get a virtual Mars vacation implant, and he opts for the, um, the spy <laughs> add-on. And it turns out, we won't go into the plot any further, but it, it turns out it blows his cover. So what is super cool about this is it's very similar for humans. Um, some research I've been looking at this year, Pasquale Leone et al., they did fMRI, so functional magnetic resonance imaging, of study participants either playing notes on the piano or imagining doing so, and they found brain changes of statistical relevance for both of those groups. And the control group who didn't imagine playing the piano and did not play the piano had no changes. And, and that is incredible. I mean, we, we, we say we know this. People know that... Um, really successful athletes often talk about the mind-body connection and vi visualizing, you know, the golf stroke, the tennis stroke. Um, but on some level, we don't really believe it. And, and the way that I know this is because most of us do not spend time each day visualizing our goals. 
<laughs> we just don't. <laughs> and if we did, it would increase what we're um, what we want to achieve. You know, the ease of achieving achieving that. But so, well created content in any genre, I I think of it as an experiential portal to for a narrative consumer, a story portal a, where a content consumer enters a liminal space, and that's similar to a dream state. And one thing that happens for people when they watch movies in particular, but a lot of people when they um, read books or consume other content, including games, is the part of the mind that judges whether something is real or not goes into sort of a hibernation because it allows suspension. And it's actually the mark also, most everyone in here knows, especially if you've written any type of fiction, the mark of good fiction is the reader's ability to suspend disbelief. So, so this interesting um, to understand that also, you know, we, we can't leave out Aristotle. Everyone knows that there's an emotional element. That the truth is humans are very complex whole beings. Three minutes. Okay. So um, I do just want to say that well created content in any genre creates an experiential portal for a narrative consumer. I have a lot more um, information about this. But what I want to say to sum this up is that um, space fitmering and off-world colonization processes are going to be brutal. Making Mars comfortable is going to take heroic efforts, massive money, much sacrifice, many, many years, and it might just be that it costs many lives. And I believe that that is what the debt, you know, the, the, the admission price of that getting that ticket punched, and I believe it's worth it. So I'm going to leave you with the words of um, Joseph Campbell, who said, a hero properly is one who gives his life to something greater than himself. So consumer content to promote the mission of Mars Enlightenment Path has the power and potential to anticipate and influence humanity's future. Homo sapiens must enter a brave new space colonization world. We need to terraform and green Mars and topical popular culture content, everything from film and television to games and books, are going to play a crucial role in cultivating the collective human conscious and unconscious in Jungian terms, and thus develop this dedication to red planet colonization that we need to have spread throughout humanity and the US and globally. So to close, Gary Oldman's character said this in The Space Between Us, which is a film about a boy who grows up on Mars and a little girl, a young girl on Earth. He says, and the rest is, well, it's not history, it's just the beginning. So I'd like to thank the Mars Society, Swansea University, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, SpaceX, Dr. Alan Bilton, Professor DJ Britton, and lastly, Ray Bradbury of Blessed Memory. So, and uh, also, um, this video is super cool. That's from the Yosemite channel, which I did get permission. Barry Chal Films on YouTube. And that's the Milky Way, a journey through the sky. <laughs>
I, so, <laughs> this, you mean, do you want to write screenplays or you want to know how I approach it? <laughs> One thing I'll say since we're here with the Mars Society is um, I have a strong aversion to um, blatant, offensive lack of scientific writing. And I'm not saying I don't include the magical and the mystical, but, it, but I, I do. But at the same time, I, you know, everything else, it needs to be possible or actual. You know, don't violate the rules of reality. Um, you need to write every day if you're going to screen. Even if you're going to screen write, if you don't have time, go, go, take a, a a working vacation with your family, and you say, "I'm sorry, I'm going to be gone from eight to five, and you go swim in the pool, and I'm going to write." <laughs> so you know, whatever you have to do to make it um, two good books, I think about life, not really about screenwriting. One is called your one. One is I think it's the one thing, and the other one is a book on essentialism, just to help people clear you know clear the space in their lives to do the things they want to do. Yes? The uh, gentleman who developed the ion drive we've drawn uh, the NASA probe Deep Space One had actually become interested in ion drives after watching an episode of the old Star Trek and talking about an ion drive. That is so fantastic. I had heard that and it I just wasn't um you know, it just didn't, wasn't something that I was going to end up talking about. But that's a thank you for sharing it. I think people need to understand how um technology and invention and science written up as fiction is driving reality, making massive changes. So thank you all for coming. I appreciate you.